clicked the start streaming button and as usual I stare at the Twitch client screen showing the Epic Tavern channel and kind of say these kinds of words as I wait to see when I'm actually visible on the stream and it looks like that's about now <clears throat> um, ooh, welcome folks uh, Oh man, my camera's not working. I've been doing Google Meet meetings lately, and every time I um, every few times I do that, it it kills the functionality of my webcam. And now that the stream's actually started, I feel like I'm totally trapped. I'm caught in this. Do I? Do I? Um, do I start? Do I turn? Do I stop the stream and then try to get my camera going and then start it again, or do I just kind of roll with it? And you know what? I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna roll with it. And so, for starters, uh, let's let's see here. Let's just quickly get an update as to the state of affairs with the project. Um, <clears throat> here is a document that we've been working on for some time, a full release roadmap. It talks about the last patch, the skills refactor, the expanded encounter types, the party dashboard beginning work, and drink chain canceling. That's the build that you can currently play. And the build that we're currently working on. And um, there have been a number of fixes that have been put into the most re the current patch, but all of them were, all of them mostly revolved around the uh, make camp break camp loop that a party can get in. Um, we feel like we found almost all of the cases, but we still see it happen occasionally. Um, and some of those cases have been very hard to identify and kill. But the current patch's um, uh, objectives for new work are supply time spirit systems and really what that means is the hunger and starvation and the loss of spirit from traveling uh, and the use of supplies to rectify hunger uh, skill check we haven't started on yet uh, this is another f a feature to finally come into play uh, requiring a particular character who uh, for a particular quest uh, I'm sure all of you have run into confusing situations where someone uh, unlocks their personal quest um, um, oh there it is okay I'm like I can't find the chat for for hmm now I'm all super confused because the chat that I see is oh because I've had it open the whole time the chat is the uh, shows the chat from yes from the last stream I get it all right my brain is almost all caught up here <clears throat> so uh, requiring a particular character for a particular quest you know let's say there's a quest that um, Mergle wants to go and visit her uh, her mentor someone she feels very strongly about and uh, wants to go visit and wants to have some of you guys come along uh, you don't have to send Mergle on that quest presently uh, and that's a that's been an issue in the game for quite some time close to well for as long as there have been personal quests or quests that relate to particular characters and so getting that feature in something that we're very interested in doing um, also the underlying data structures and features to accommodate skill specializations um, and then additional content, and by content I mean written content, uh, story content, encounter and quest content, uh, to fill in gaps in the new encounter categories. Uh, presently what's being worked on are a, lot, a number of ranged combat encounters. Uh, well, it's really actually combat encounters that uh, have procedural damage or damage that uh, characters can take randomly. Uh, additionally, they might they lean a little more heavily on ranged encounters because we had uh, a disparity between the melee encounters and ranged encounters. Our general idea is that we have roughly similar amounts of each of the encounter types, um, so that uh, well one 
uh, so that you don't see too many repeats, and two, as a way of saying that these encounters are, if by supporting them all equally, it means all of the characters and all of their skills have an equal potential value in the game experience. There are a number of ways for you to modify that, and from region to region there will be differences. Um, but that's partly why. I think we'll also probably be creating a number of um, uh, mind knowledge encounters, uh, as well as survival, um, uh, survival exploration encounters. All the other encounters, not all of them, because some encounters there are many more of them than the other types, but uh, a number of different encounters will have a, a handful of additional enc uh, encounters made for their category as well. Now, just to go back to this line here, underlying data structures and features to accommodate skill specializations. Currently, we're in the middle of a potential decision, um, and we might combine patch 2 with patch 3, depending on how that works out. And part of that is because the underlying data structures and features to accommodate skill specializations, some aspects of that have turned out to be easier than we were expecting. And so then the result would be for the next patch to include as well skill specializations. Uh, but pat okay, well, and at that point uh, here, I'll uh, put a little asterisk here. There we go. We may very want to. We will have to move the. Uh, under the hood work for equipment refactor into the patch that comes after it at that point. Uh, and then the if if this combination of uh, patch objectives happens, then <clears throat> patch 3 will become the equipment refactor patch, but it will have to include the under the hood work for the equipment refactor. There are a number of things that we can add into this, this patch as well to kind of cover any um, any dependencies on equipment refactor. There, Ultimately, maybe a non-zero chance that equipment refactor get pushed back one patch as well. Uh, we we'll just have to kind of um, in the next couple weeks, we're probably playing it by ear and trying to get a better understanding of what the good, the right call is. Uh, once we get through the equipment refactor, and I think I can roll down a bit here to kind of, I think we have some details about the equipment refactor. The nature of that work, the patch that would come after the skill specializations. Um, is not just, well, really think of it as finishing the equipment system. What you see in the game presently is extremely anemic and only in the you know, mildest terms kind of uh, um, uh, affects the game. The imagination of the experience is it still has an important part to play, but it doesn't actually change the game play much. Um, it gives you some extra bonus skill points, and uh, that was never really the plan. And what you see there, we've kind of, I think everyone's gotten a little bit used to it, and everyone getting used to it makes us feel sad. Um, because it kind of makes you guys, you guys are probably seeing the game, and it's like, that's what we wanted to do. Um, and it is not what we wanted to do. So this is an, a step closer uh, towards making equipment as important um, as it as we feel that it should be uh, as well as kind of taking a more important role in what your character is about and you know what their strengths and weaknesses are and so the first equipment refactor what's up Roggle ambition um, is for the to keep our three slots it's worth noting we're not really satisfied with a three slot equipment system but in the course of a given patch we're not really going to be able to do much more than just make the equipment more uh, valuable and interesting and so we won't be expanding the number of equipment slots <clears throat> so the weapon slot is going to become much more focused like well it will be a combat e item uh, and there will be inherent uh, skill power benefits in using weapons to the point and enough like a strong uh, significant skill power uh, bonus uh, sufficiently powerful that it is going to require us to tune all combat encounters to have higher difficulty values because the assumption will be now that all of your characters are holding something in their hands because not holding something in your hands is an enormous um, oversight in terms of your characters being able to effectively contribute to combat. 
So kind of in the past, there generally be characters that have nothing that they can really contribute to a combat encounter. And uh, as the characters level up, um, um, that will kind of become the case that uh, a, a low-level character holding a weapon isn't necessarily meaningfully contributing to a high-difficulty, high-level encounter for combat. <clears throat> but at the beginning, it'll be the char the combat specialized characters will simply just have a decent chunk more to contribute, and all the ba and all your lower level characters in low level content will have something significant to contribute. So the choices you make for what they hold in their hands will matter quite a bit, <clears throat> and what those the weapons can do will be expanded rather than just kind of giving you a plus one to a combat encounter or plus one skill. Uh, the equipment can modify your chances to hit the bonus skill power. Um, change the damages to take damage and or potentially modify the difficulty of the encounter. <coughs> um, the armor slots will be centrally focused on damage reduction. Um, by the way, it's probably worth clarifying, the basic system that the that you see with equipment currently isn't going to change. Uh, all equipment will still generally have bonuses to skills, um, but as we go forward, more and more of those uh, plus one to X type of encounter, plus one for this, I mean, plus one for this skill, or plus one for this type of encounter, etc., etc., that those will be seen more like magical bonuses, um, rather than the es essence of the item. The item now will have an essence and a bonus associated with that essence, that a, that a sword will, you know, give you a bonus to hit or to, it'll give you a bonus on your roll for success um, and give you a nominal amount of skill power bonus. Whereas a mace will not give you the bonus to hit, but contribute a little bit more skill power. Now some of your choices can kind of customize uh, the way your characters will be interacting with those combat encounters. Um, add to that an idea, we may not be able to get it going in the equipment refactor, but we also like this idea of uh, weapon specialization. So the more you use the weapons, the more bonuses you get out of the weapons for characters that aren't combat focused it ends up having weapons become kind of a part of their character so it's like you know this diplomat carries around a bow and arrow that's just part of his character and because of having used that bow and arrow for a long period of time it kind of makes you sad not to use a bow and arrow because you'll lose bonuses and then the time you spent to build up that character's skill specialization makes it feel like you don't want to switch and so there's a negative to that. The negative to that is that character isn't isn't very flexible. Or you're like, well, it, well, what if I want that character to use a different weapon? Or what if I find a great weapon for that character to use? You're still free to do that, but it also means part of the story with these character classes is that non-combat classes, they aren't as flexible with their weapon choices. They aren't as flexible with their relationship with combat in general. It's not necessarily as easy, and it may not be a good call. However, in the context of the of the combat classes, there'll be a number of um, uh, skill specializations, and um, you know we have to determine whether there'll be class traits or not. But that they'll have a uh, an easier time learning multiple weapon types, um, as well as um, uh, just kind of get more benefit out of. Um, They'll have they'll have less constraints on switching between weapon types, basically. Um, so armor slot will be about damage reduction, and we'll probably rig up a um, a spirit travel cost to armor that reduces more damage. And so it'll be very much in the kind of classic D and D form, and it'll also lead to maybe casters who use the spirit to spe to, to cast their spells and encounters it'll prompt them to want to use lighter armor. Uh, the accessory slot is the universal slot, which, um, uh, you know, cover the non-combat related encounter types. So travel pack may give you a bonus to exploration, survival exploration encounters. Um, you know, jewelry might give you a bonus to befriend social encounters. We'll come, we'll try, we're trying to have a list of item accessory accessory classes or accessory item types uh, that are associated have an associated bonus um, with any given uh, encounter type Lou bagel combo 5 welcome um, 
And so that gives you a quick summary of the of the state of. Oh, wait, oh, sorry. Let me kind of. It is not. I'm not done with the summary. Uh, that gives you a summary of the equipment refactor, and um, uh, the patch that will come after the equipment refactor is the wealth and goods patch, uh, an update to the way we handle the friendship currency, um, and finally getting loot divvy to work right, um, making true use of wealth rank, and a creating some features that create a relationship between a character's wealth rank and the kind of food and drink that they order. And then down here there's this phrase for procedural rewards uh, which is kind of like loot boxes. I know that word has become a bad word these days in the game industry. Um, but what we mean by that is, you know, a reward that is randomized. <laughs> and to be fair, there are some small percent chances of getting better things, so it is not, it's ultimately not terribly different from a thing like a gambling mechanic, except that you don't actually gamble to get them. It's more a matter of procedural encounters leading to procedural reward. And also, because we're fantasy, we call them loot chests. Um, <clears throat> so this patch, when we get there, uh, will be about uh, all about kind of getting a feature in place that allows you to invest really it kind of boils down to investing gold in your characters and the investment in gold in your characters leads to them being able to um, contribute more to the profits of the uh, tavern and of course you invest gold in the loot divvy after a quest and then we give you some counter pressure like uh, there, there are some features that, that limit taking all the gold for yourself because it'll hurt your relationship with your characters on your roster and then obviously there are limits to giving them all the gold because then you wouldn't be able to spend it on the stuff that you want to in the tavern one might one might think based on what I just said there that it might they might recall the reality that maybe there's not enough to buy in the tavern and of course over the course of time getting to this point will definitely have to have more things that can sink mo that pe players can sink money into um, and hopefully some kind of high ticket items that you could purchase that are that are beneficial or upgrades to the tavern um, now in doing so then there is some pressure to get as much money as possible uh, so that you could try to buy some of those uh, upgrades uh, which would which would be in conflict or in opposition uh, to the desire to lose uh, friendship uh, with the characters on your roster and in order for that to be a meaningful counter pressure the friendship itself has to have a little more oomph to it has to have a little more value and so there are two things that would be happening in this patch one wealth rank will be exposed to the player and by and wealth rank is basically like a you know, I'll just quickly go like um, we'll go six levels I think we talked about seven levels uh, So something along those lines. Uh, and then everyone's starting, well, it's, oh yeah, it's six levels, but it's really seven levels because there's a zero rank, which means basically destitute. Um, for the characters, when they go on quests and you give them gold, that gold that you give to them fills an experience point bar, basically. It fills the wealth rank experience bar. And so as they gain in wealth rank, they go from basically destitute to poor to fantasy not poor to legitimately middle class, which is fairly wealthy, to wealthy wealthy, which is like nobility, to extremely wealthy, which is really out of scope for the game, uh, but we want to have two more wealth ranks in there that basically represent nearly one of the richest care, play, care one of the richest people in the world, and extraordinarily wealthy super one percenter type that, um, you know, who's who's rich as hell now part of the part of the game's functionality with respect to this will be that our, our stories can subtract 
and or add to a character's wealth rank depending on things that happen. So there may be like this big inheritance that a character ha gets and we might even try to make it so that it could be totally randomly associated with a character. So some at some point someone there's a quest and coincidentally one of the people that you sent on the quest happens to be related somehow um, and the and concluding that quest or quest chain results in one of those characters getting a big inheritance. So that would be a case where we'd add to your wealth rank and or just simply set it to one of the uh, higher wealth ranks. <clears throat> and then of course there could be situations where there's um, so and so someone gets kidnapped and there's a ransom and the only way to solve it, we give you a mutually exclusive quest choice, and one of those quest choices is that the <coughs> that the characters that go have to just give up some of their money to actually cover the ransom because the person has no money or something, and then everyone loses a wealth rank. Who knows? I'm I'm, I'm just kind of pull stuff out of my out of my the back of my head to come up with these things. At least presently, this stuff is a bit ahead in the in the timeline. Um, so one half of it is that wealth rank, and then the other half of it is a friendship rank. So right now, all friendship does is you kind of interact with them in the tavern, and if you do that, it increases friendship. And as friendship increases, the first thing that gets crossed is a threshold to hire. Once the threshold to hire has been crossed, now they are eligible to choose to ask to be hired. Um, and then past that, friendship crosses thresholds that unlock um, uh, personal stories for the characters. So we're not going to dis we're not going to change that part of it, but we'll add to it a kind of a a living experience point like system where as you get as you add friendship points into a character, your relationship with them can go from a what rank 1 2 3 4 5 6 7, maybe something similar to to wealth but maybe not as exponential in its nature that it's really kind of just linear related, linearly related to the amount of interacting you do. And so if, you know, a, and that al along with these friendship ranks that, that characters on your roster can gain, uh, come with some, some basic benefits. And then the key with friendship, though, is that there are a number of things that can reduce friendship bad things that happen on the road can bring your friendship with that character down, and then you'll lose some of those benefits as a result. If any of you have played a game called Tyranny, um, it they have a a um, a love and fear uh, mechanic with the character relationships. And if as a character has more love for you and or fear of you, certain thresholds get crossed and different abilities become available as a result of that. Now, we're not talking necessarily abilities, although that's not off the table, but at the very least it kind of gives you an idea of a dynamic and moving um, point on a number line, and the point you're at determines the benefits you get then or at or now. And so that's the direction we're kind of going to head with the with patch five wealth and goods. Uh, patch six is largely undefined because uh, a number of things will have to happen in the tavern as we do all the other stuff leading up to this patch. Uh, and derived from that experience, we'll probably make some calls and uh, choose to within the course of roughly a patch period, which we're kind of like let's just say somewhere between five and eight weeks, um, uh, we will devote time to improving the tavern experience, and then. Patch T, which is a patch period entirely focusing on tutorials. By the way, when patch 6 gets completed, we're generally going to be feature locked for full release and we'll maintain a we'll maintain a state where we won't be adding features until after full release. Um, for those of you who are new or who haven't heard me say this before, although I say it literally every time, uh, even though this is described as a roadmap to full release, we have no intention of stopping our relationship with developing Epic Tavern when full release hits. If, as long as the game doesn't tank, we are 100% committed to continuing developing Epic Tavern, continuing to expand its feature set. Uh, I think our long-term view of the game is fairly ambitious. Um, that said, uh, we realize that being in early access kind of means hiding from most of the gamers out there, and so we need to construct and get to a, a, a line in the sand that represents a complete 
playable experience and when it is complete then we will go to full release and then once it's at full release and then we'll go crazy well we'll, we'll continue to go crazy with the game so patch T right now there's obviously some quest assignment and some questing and loot divvy there are a number of other things we may have to tutorial uh, I'm sure how we'll have extensive conversations with the audience and figuring out the things that they had difficulty learning and right now it's a lot of things hopefully by then it'll be fewer things and then the uh, <laughs> it's a to-do bucket. This is a place where I just kind of we just kind of keep tasks that uh, we, we're trying to determine where it fits in, whether we'll do it before or after full release, etc. And if it is before in when any, any of the preceding patches, whether it makes sense. Patch E, the true last patch before full release. Uh, it is the last leg. It is polish. And patch E is for patch end, I guess. And a lot of details got added into here that are patch, uh, their UI polish related, and that's going to be naturally a huge part of it. Uh, I think from patch to patch in the current context of development, there are a lot of things that we don't get to. There are a lot of fixes that just aren't high enough priority, and it's just really essential that we kind of keep the ball rolling in terms of filling in the feature sets that are there. And as we close up our relationship with early access, we also have to close our relationship with allowing for bugs to stay in the game for any reasonable period of time and some of these aren't bugs some of these are really just kind of quality of life changes and or uh, kind of visual improvements uh, but sometimes the visuals are so bad in some of these cases that improving it is like fixing a bug um, and obviously other things that need to happen in the in the last patch uh, or the patch number E are economy tuning, character progression rate tuning, balancing between difficulty and character powers, slash specializations. <clears throat> now, all that probably, I mean, it makes it, I'm assuming it makes a lot of sense, you know, polish and tune before getting it to full release. Um, and then, naturally, after full release, uh, we are populating a list of the things that we're going to tackle afterward. Um, generally speaking, it's been our impression that the moment we go to full release, uh, kind of maybe depending on maybe the first month or two sales, um, I have a feeling that we'll be just fixing bugs in those first couple of months and in those and and we'll be monitoring the performance of the product. Uh, depending on the performance of the product and depending on the response of the audience that means you guys um, or maybe it'll be more than you guys by then <laughs> hopefully um, <coughs> uh, we'll identify what our next big initiative will be the 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 first thing we do after full release it's very likely to either be workshop tools and feature features or the Deep relationship slash complex personality system or tavern customization it'll be one of those three things and once that one of those three things is done we'll probably do one of the other two things and then naturally then the third thing that said there is room for a bunch of new stuff to be discovered um, we might very well find that in its complete ish state that there's just uh, some obvious things that really we just need to do now because we're all just too excited about it and we need to have it um, of course that remains to be seen so that it's 4:35. Uh, that kind of concludes kind of the synopsis of development for the project uh, I can kind of briefly go over last uh, Wednesday's stream we talked about the world map design and uh, um, if, if you missed that stream and have any questions please uh, I recommend you go to our discord channel and maybe start up a conversation we're always really happy to answer questions there and I think what my intent was to play a little bit of Epic Tavern and as we walk through it uh, maybe kind of um, just kind of a point out feedback like pass actually right before that I'll give you a tiny bit of history 
So, uh, you know, one of the kind of standard pieces of the uh, of the Epic Tavern dev stream, especially the Friday stream, uh, is to kind of um, share with you guys some of our documentation from the past and kind of tell stories about the history of the game's development. So this document here, it's called Beginning. It was hastily named um, as we were in the weeks leading up to releasing the game on Early Access. Uh, there were a number of issues in the beginning of the game, and we also need to create create a tutorial for that experience. Uh, everything was a, was a was a big hurry. What do I see here? Yeah, and a little bit of kind of design thinking that kind of went into there. Uh, so, you know, we we kind of create these, there's a number of kind of, hey, this is how it is, and hey, these are some things we'd like to do, um, documents. Showing kind of the beginning of the game, that the kind of main menu, talk about fading into black upon loading, once you select a new game, fade out before the load screen, and then moving on to fade into a black screen, take this text and display line by line. And we're just kind of talking about the way in which this experience will unfold. This isn't at all how the game ended up, right? Uh, this is this, these designs uh, exist before our prologue quest. The prologue quest kind of came into play maybe barely, barely like a month and a half, maybe six weeks before actually getting to full release, I mean, uh, to uh, early access release. And in the lead up to that, we were kind of puzzling over how do we make the beginning feel right. And so a large number of details and proposals uh, about kind of how we wanted this to go, you know, fade up from black, start with a view of the tavern, hide the UI, accept the title of the tavern, an empty space for the AP bar. Tavern is too dark, it needs to be brightened up. Let's get seven characters in the tavern, all but two characters seated. Obviously, it's not how it is now, uh, but this is this represents kind of a slice of time in our efforts to kind of make our way to the actual launching of the uh, uh, of early access. And here's a bunch of Eric Pavone's um, concerns about uh, the proposal and uh, and his contributing and adding to it. In some kind, in so many cases, kind of describing and defining it. Uh, yeah, you know, I'll just jump ahead a little bit. I don't want to kind of spend too much time here, but if it does drive any questions, I'm more than willing to kind of get into more detail. Uh, you know, this this represents us getting these kind of sums icons over the characters' heads. Uh, character interaction UI needs for the character's dialogue string to be dramatically boosted in footprint. And if you remember when we launched on early access, we kind of had this bottom half or bottom third of the screen kind of would would be populated with a display relating to the character. Uh, in today's world, a lot of that information is wrapped around the character uh, in the middle, you know, on top of the 3D view. Uh, but our first approach was to have this kind of character display area. And our initial um, expression of what the character says and or the text that comes out, the text that describes what the character says, just wasn't just wasn't noticeable enough. Uh, you'd look at the screen, and you know, you could you'd, you'd barely notice that it was even there. Area and outlined, and as I the way I described it at the time was the area outlined in red is in desperate need. Its importance is high, and it needs to feel like the focus of this UI context. In the casual view of the player, it is drowned out by the other information that is available. And that statement really carried through week after week, month after month. We're showing too much information generally all the time. And as uh, our UI iterations kind of continued, it would winnow down passive information in favor in dynamically displaying what is important right now. I don't know what this stuff is. There'll be five types of quest for now that handle tavern related upgrades. Any upgrade or restocking of goods will be handled by embarking on a quest. The upgrade or good shipment isn't unlocked unless the quest is a success. This is a period of time where we started to say, like, well, if our mechanic, if the way in which we change the exp of the game is to start a, unlock a quest, start a quest, and complete it, then maybe all of the tavern's upgrades should be that way. Um, that's not going to be strictly the case, but if you know, as you play the game, you kind of get that you get that connection that you have to do things with the characters or with the parties to do to complete things in the tavern. All right, let's take a look at the state of the game right now. I'm just going to do kind of a straight sort of let's play, and I'll um, 
talk about some of the notes I'll be taking as I do so. And this will kind of represent one of the most uh, conventional ways in which we just kind of look at the build and identify issues and um, get together items that need to be addressed. <clears throat> in recent times, we added this screen. And when we're talking about the overall experience of Epic Tavern, we are literally talking about everything. And from the moment the first visual comes up, even the loading screen, all those elements can matter. <clears throat> Excuse me. Must be weird. It just says Tomo and doesn't show my head. Next, I'll get my st uh, uh, I'll get all this square. I'll get my setup squared away for the next stream. <clears throat> so over the course of time, uh, we've had chances to look at other games that are in early access and just also puzzle over how we message the fact that we're in early access and what some of the ramifications of being in early access means to our users. And so we put this screen together. There's no way to avoid it. It's easy to move on because if you've been playing the game, you can just cool, go straight to cool, let's play. It's not uh, necessarily a significant amount of friction, but we want that friction there because we want to remind you we're not done. We're in development. We want you to pay more attention. We want you to talk to us about your experience. And to that effect, we put a Discord link in as well as a Steam forums link. Um, and our little... Would you want me to kind of initially want to say disclaimer, but really it's our statement. It's like, this is why we're here, guys. Epic Tavern is a game currently in development. What this means is that we are still in the process of making it. While we work hard to keep things as stable as possible, you may occasionally run across bugs and glitches. You can let us know about this at our Discord or Steam forums, link to the left. Welcome to the latest unstable build. This patch includes the following major changes. Ooh, that's the thing is we probably got to take that unstable out. There's a one bug. And this is kind of the detail you kind of need to be looking at things at. And it's like, how did you miss that, you might ask? Well, we're looking at a lot of things every time we get a build out. And sometimes our brains don't see differences. Because we've seen it so many times. All right, so, um, and this describes some of the underpinnings of this current patch. Cool, let's play. And so, we've all seen this. I have, by the way, I'm testing in 16 by 10. I now always test in 16 by 10. There are a number of UI issues and configure and and uh, visual artifacts as a result of playing in 16 by 10. We will eventually get through all of them. We try to get through the ones that cause direct confusion. Um, but again. It's just uh, a lot of things have priority. Um, so we look at our EA, our early access build is 1030. It says, welcome, Mr. Tomo. Everything looks like it's in order. The news feed is referencing the right stuff. All the cool here is very when temperature rises. It's not because the dragon's breathing on you. It's time to head to Varenholm Beach and soak up the sun in between volleyball to the death and delicious rap barbecues. We here at Hyperkinetic have been working hard on the latest ET patch. Click below for more info. So let's... I'm going to go ahead and click. And this correctly comes up. And detailed nether scroll tavern news and tavern scroll number 52. From version 1026, we get a lot of. I always like how we use the, the we use TLDR, <laughs> but in inevitably, what's below TLDR is too oh, kind of too long. Oh, is this is this your taverns here? Here, let me let me just let me delete some of these because I will start a new tavern. Oh, the clever names. I see, I see, yes. <laughs> They're, they are excellent names for taverns. That looks like it's all working. Roadmap and contact us. I'll test that a little bit later because that'll just bring up a browser window, I think. Uh, and then we can select through these. Everything generally functioning. And then we start a new tavern. Oh, my camera uh, doesn't work right now. Uh, it's because I've been doing too many uh, Google Hangouts calls and it looks like when I do those 
it feels like every time I do three of them, it breaks my camera. And then I started right when the thing started, and I noticed it wasn't working, and then I felt like I couldn't stop it to get it to reboot and everything. So that's okay. I guess now it's the the uh, the the disembodied voice of Epic Tavern. So I'll generate a random name, Bashful Knight. I like that one. You old faithful Caltrop. You old fabulous husk in the slanderous flail. The slanderous flail. I think that describes a lot of people these days. <laughs> um, you old purple husk in Wayfarer. You old thirsty wench pub. The curved, curved rogue. <laughs> the choking arcane blade. The brown toad and blade. You old llama and anchor. The heaving demon. Generally, I, just, I like looking for uh, tavern names that are just really long because I kind of like what happens when the font gets smaller. And it also gets, there's always some comedy when it's a, a really, um, a really long convoluted name. So here we'll just do some. Oh, that was one. I'm making the noise, by the way, so that I can stop making it to stop myself from clicking. It's like a weird the where wayfaring gluttonous munchkin that'll have to work for me we'll open that tavern and start the prologue long ago the land of Beor was nearly annihilated by a horde of netherkin invading through the flaming gate villages were trampled to dust and Beor burned after a grueling war, the Netherkin were defeated and the Flaming Gate was sealed. So one of the things I'm already kind of taking a look at here is that our kind of scene transitions there are just a little bit too harsh. And that a quick fade between those would be a nice cushion between uh, visual transitions. And welcome to our, our, our pre-prologue conversation. The idea here was to kind of give players a view of the tavern, and we kind of recreating that rhythm where you in the tavern and you're clicking on characters and you're clicking things that give information about characters, sometimes conversation. And then we'll transition after that into a, a world map and questing. You know I hate that name, Eric. You and Lycaeus are the only Ravengers that makes us sound like, well, we're all... I didn't pick it, Blaze. People just started calling us that. You getting senile in your old age? You spent half a year trying to get that name to stick. Bottoms up, kids. If Ignatius is to, believe, to be believed, the Flaming Gate won't hold much longer. And where's Thorgrim? Facilities. A tavern's facilities cater to the needs of its heroes and ensure they are ready to face the perils of adventuring. Now, however, is the time to fight. Pull Thorgrim from his bath. And we're trying to tutorial the experience of some of our facilities and that characters can be entered into them and that you can take them out. Uh, getting the player used to the user, use the user interface. You sure you don't need another hour or two in there, Thorgrim? Hate to rush you. Bah, cut a doom dwarf some slack. Of all your half-assed plans, this may be the worst. You have a better idea? Can't say that I do, but it doesn't make yours any less awful. Then we're agreed. My plan it is, Lycasia. Do you have the letter and the deed? Right here, Merrick. We are abandoning our child. We're doing what has to be done. Besides, we survived worse than this. Okay. Not really. But if you die first, I'll raise you as a banshee or something. A banshee? At least make me a vampire. I would look amazing with fangs. Deal. Alright, people. Gear up. And then it shifts us to the equipment screen. And we wanted to just set you up to kind of look at all, look at the way our equipment system worked and a chance to kind of look at the adventurer roster and kind of start getting enticed by what these numbers mean and what these skills mean. All you have to do in the tutorial, though, is to add a weapon to Thorgrin. Um... And that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to miss this place. Blaze says, Pace yourself, dwarf. We aren't dead yet. Thorgrin says, I know, I, I just... Enough of that talk. Lycasia, are you ready? Nope, but that's not apt to change. Let's go. New quest. And then this is the first time the player sees our quest unlocked pop-up. 
a tale from the past, and we're trying to message that this is in the past, we did intend at the beginning to kind of put a sepia tone over all of this beginning part, um, maybe except for the UI elements, and that that would help kind of message to players that this was happening in the past. And I've seen on streams there is a fair amount of confusion with respect to that, but it does kind of sort itself out once you actually play. Still, it would be nice if we could capture that kind of vintage vibe uh, in the beginning of the uh, game. For the first time in 1400 years, the Flaming Gate has been breached and a horde of netherkin are pouring into the realm. Fight your way to the Nethercap Mountains and use the artifact provided by Ignatius Mordred to seal the gate before the world is lost. <clears throat> now in the normal flow of uh, playing the turns, of course, it would simply just unlock the quest and then it's, um, you'd, have to, you'd have to close the turn yourself, but in the name, in in service of the fact, well, one, players don't know how to play yet, necessarily, and we want to move things along. There is nothing for you to do here except for select a one-way trip. There is nothing for you to do here, well, I think we can go back and forth, but to add the four characters to the party. And then if you start kind of trying to look at this, you'll kind of be able to read the introduction, kind of identify that this is where the destination is and it kind of tells you that the quest challenge is combat and melee and you don't really know what that means uh, your chances are good you have kind of low mind skills and super low or close to zero social skills and you don't know what that means and at some point you have nothing to do but to accept and then you can kind of keep looking around going man is it okay for me to click go forth and then you do it. Uh, Misko Blood asks, is it possible to skip this intro quest on new playthroughs yet? So that's a bit of a tricky issue. We need to figure out how we can make that possible. Because one of the things that this intro quest does is it sets a number of variables for your whole playthrough. So in order to skip the prologue quest, we would need to be able to allow you in a single button simply get to the end. But we need to process this quest because a number of characters get unlocked, a number of quest chains get unlocked, a number of goods get unlocked, all depending on your success and failure of the first several encounters. So here, let's, uh, these here, right here is an example of the kind of pop-ups that we bring up. This is another little piece of evidence we're trying to convince, you know, trying to let the players know that we're talking about the past. The Last Ride of the Ravenger 4. This is the story of the legendary heroes who saved the land of Baor. The results of their final ride will affect the story world and change the characters available in your tavern. And we set forth. So I'm going to kind of accelerate this because it is 454. And I'm not going to read every word out loud. And so though we get to this first encounter here, it's a melee combat encounter, and one of the things you'll notice is that all of these encounters are combat melee for the most part. Uh, this was in a period of time when, um, well, it's high time to update this intro quest to include other encounter types and include compound encounters. Uh, that'll It'll kind of be a more interesting story to read through because going through it multiple times, not only will there be random encounters selected, but the way those encounters unfold will vary depending on the success and failure from the party. Hold the line, soldiers. If you run, I will kill you myself, roars a young squire to her panicked comrades, their commanders lying dead on the ground around them, and netherkin with featureless faces swarming from all sides. Lycasia raises her bow as the heroes rush to reinforce the squires. So I'll just go ahead and pick some precise rolls here because it's a little bit overpowered. So we succeeded and as a result of our success, Odessa Dauntless has been unlocked. This future knight will never forget fighting alongside the Ravenger 4 as a squire and looks forward to visiting your tower tavern. So if we lost this encounter, a different thing would have occurred. An item would have been unlocked or a quest chain would have been unlocked. Um, but the sh simple answer to your question, Miss Go Blood, is it is not skippable yet. Um, and that is largely because to make it skippable and for the game to kind of function the way we're expecting it to, it will take a, uh, we need an alternate path that allows us to process the various things that get unlocked. Um, <clears throat> but I could easily imagine kind of a 
Oh dear, you see, you see what, what, what the wrong house is writing? If you fail on this one, Odessa gets killed, and Merrick raises her as a vampire. I have a planned quest where you'll have to deal with her if you failed and got her killed in the prologue. <laughs> Suffice to say, it's really like this prologue quest is an essential part of the story. It has dynamic and procedural elements to it that have a, an impact um, on the whole story um, uh, of your of that of this of whatever this tavern's playthrough will be. Um, that's not to say that we're averse to skipping the prologue. It takes a while. It's and it would be fantastic and convenient if you could just simply know all the things that were unlocked and be able to see a summary. Uh, and so the work it'll take for that user interface experience. Um, will come with other benefits when we get around to it because it'll also allow us to kind of auto complete quests part of that means though that uh, you won't be able to kind of min max your um, your approach to the prologue or any given quest if there is a, a fast track and so one of the things we can see and um, it is 457 so I will be bringing the I'll bring the stream to a close around 510 because I did get started just a tiny bit late um, you wouldn't be able to min-max and use your special abilities to get the results you want. And so right here we say, Outside the Tanglevine Winery, a monstrously fat netherkin barks orders to his troops in a guttural alien tongue. They rush to attack the Vintner's house. So when you fail this one, it corrupts the land of the winery. And that's what unlocks uh, uh, Netherberry moonshine I think no nether nether berry nether wine oh my god I can't believe I'm forgetting the words but uh, the tainted wine that came from this winery so let's say you've played this game a number of times uh, I might I might fail this one on purpose and so in I might go with defensive right because that's minus 15 power Maybe I go with aggressive because it reduces my chances. 55% chance. I kind of like that. Oh, shoot! Oh, well, there it is. I've won the encounter. And so instead of unlocking the, 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 the tainted wine, no pop-up. Kids get in the attic. Go, the vintner yells, herding her children up the stairs and taking up a defensive stance with her pitchfork to guard it. The heroes burst through the door just in time, saving the appreciative winemaker and her children after a fierce, bloody battle. Um, if I'm not mistaken, does this unlock aged elven wine then? Is that what, it, what just happened there? And there's just somehow the pop-up's not working? Anyways, as your familiarity with this improves, you may very well want to just play the details of the prologue quest to kind of customize your playthrough in a way. Uh, that said, they're really... We're not averse to giving players more choices. Like, uh, maybe that summary that auto-completes the prologue, maybe we just let you hit buttons and make switches, you know? Especially maybe after you've played a certain amount of time, it unlocks that feature so that in subsequent playthroughs you can choose your own way. Uh, we don't like forcing people to do busy work necessarily, but to some extent it does happen in the game. Now, um, some other things we can expect to see happening in this prologue quest that'll uh, add to, it, to the experience as we continue down the path of adding features to the game. <clears throat> the skill specializations... I'm going to take a brief aside to kind of just... So the skill specializations <coughs> are a really significant add to the functionality or the options that a player has to interact with the game. Uh, all of these, the skill specializations, that it is a system whereby once you put 10 skill points into a given skill, you'll be given an option of one of three skill specializations to choose one of three skill specializations. And those skill specializations vary from being special abilities that you can use in encounters, which by the way, will populate this list and so a level 10 cleric well we're gonna have pre-chosen the skill specializations for Thorgrin, Lycasia, American Blaze but those skill specializations or the the ones that unlock encounter abilities 
uh, will be here available for you to choose. Now, the way those work is that if this is a melee combat encounter, a cleric, certainly when it comes to combat healing, one of those skill specializations is a combat related uh, special ability that will heal or and or um, block or subtract from damage taken. Um, and also maybe recover hit points that other people, you know, the people have lost. Um, so you may very well want to be using that ability. Uh, the survivalist class is a little bit light on combat uh, abilities. Uh, Lycasia has a lot of combat skill for a survivalist. Um, but then when the survival encounters do come up, like the ones where they're kind of creeping along the, the cliff, uh, some of her skill specializations might offer a uh, boosted power ability that uses spirit, for example. And um, so all of these characters will have more abilities in this prologue quest that you'll get to play around with and kind of explore as a first-time user. Um, so let's just get outside of this quickly. Oh, I guess I get Elve Age of Wine on this one. So I'm going to pause real quick. So what you see here, if you, this interface, I think, is mostly not available in the current build. This is staging build, uh, but this is the nature of the um, f adventure op actions, which is another kind of ability that gets unlocked via the skill specializations. So you, that 10 po tenth point into a skill, you get to choose one of three specializations. Those specializations come in the form of either event actions, which would populate the last list I just described, or just showed. Uh, adventure actions, which would populate this list for the party, um, and or replace or improve some of the existing options. Uh, as well as uh, tavern related uh, abilities which might come in the form of special uh, interactions that be that are available for those characters and or custom responses or custom results that can occur uh, as a result of participating in drink chains or drink and food chains uh, as you can see this see here this dashboard the party dashboard has been updated to be a little more visual and iconic in nature kind of describing the traversal of time over the course of the day uh, as well as the traveling travel distance from the tavern to the destination and eventually back again um, and a display showing your supplies uh, here you see those ration buttons um, but this is all going to get largely reconfigured to kind of support a uh, feed them this this character would like to eat a meal and when they eat a meal they lose one of their hunger stacks all that stuff's going to have a pretty big effect on kind of the friction of longer quests and also every time anything bad happens on an encounter it'll contribute to the other friction of just traveling and getting exhausted and tired uh, you'll be able to be making choices of whether you're trying to rectify that which will make the quest take longer uh, definitely once the all these features are in place uh, quests could take as long as you wanted them to you could rest every day you could search and forage every day. That may not be a reasonable thing to do, uh, but you are free to go a few feet away from the tavern and starve your parties to death, I guess. Uh, you know, in that situation, we would definitely feel like we want to create some fail safes and that a party that was within a day's travel from the beginning of a turn that is suffering terribly because of starvation and such may very well without your consent block all of your options and get the hell back home and at the cost of significant friendship um, those kinds of features we love those kinds of features because it, 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 it lets the characters appear like they're they're them not you they're not your little pawns that you can move around. They're your. They're people that you have a relationship with. You pay oftentimes to do stuff, and that over the course of time, your friendship becomes more stronger. And granted, higher ranked friendship means you can exploit the characters more, but it'll cost. And then those characters may not like you as much after, and then you'll have to work on your friendship again. And so you can think of it as friendship capital. That when burned is has to be 
and you have to you have to do work to recover uh, the same degree of friendship you had before. <coughs> um, all right, it's 5:06, and I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this dev stream. I uh, hope you found it informative and interesting. Uh, again, if you guys have any concerns and or are inspired to continue any of the conversations here or any of the ideas here into conversation uh, further, please come to our Discord channel. Uh, we more than welcome uh, for you to engage us there. Um, now, I think, what is it? It is, uh, why, if you were lurking, throw me an 07 so I know to call you out. And now I'm going to say thank you to you all. So thank you so much for coming. And um, and the next stream will be on Monday. And the next dev chat will be on Tuesday. Uh, a Fool's Duty. Thank you. Catfish Water Dancer. Commander Root. Hosts Me Raffle. Lou Bagel Combo 5. Lurks. Misco Blood. Revek Oz. Or Revecos. S1 F A K A, I guess S1 Faka. The Wrong House, V and K, Virgo Pros. Uh, thank you again for coming by and checking out the dev stream. And I will talk to you guys soon.